be such a full room for Jordan. We've got, hmm, you might be in the overflow room. <laughs> Are there some seats? Oh, and there's some over here. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kate Seeley with the Middle East Institute. Thank you all so much for joining us on such a chilly day for this discussion about the aftermath of the Jordanian elections and a look ahead at the challenges that the uh, kingdom will be facing. We're very fortunate to be joined by two uh, Jordan experts who have just returned from monitoring the parliamentary elections and who have both spent a lot of time in the kingdom over the years. Uh, Leslie Campbell of the National Democratic Institute and Danya Greenfield of the Rafiq Hariri Center for the Middle East. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Jordan held its 17th parliamentary elections on January 23rd in the shadow of growing frustration and uh, protests inside the kingdom for broader political representation and more democratic governance. Uh, the king promised substantive uh, electoral reform um, after the protests in 2011 that spread throughout the region uh, in June of that year. He called for an electoral law that would result in, quote, a parliament with active political party representation that allows the formation of governments based on a parliamentary majority. These past elections were viewed as considerably fairer and more transparent than any of the previous polls. More seats were reserved for women in the parliament, 15 up from 12. But by and large, critics have been saying that the changes to the law were cosmetic and did not significantly deliver promises for a more representative, politically robust uh, parliament. The general consensus has been that Jordan uh, delayed real structural reforms to the electoral uh, process. I'm not sure if my speaker, the speakers agree with that, but that's, that's sort of been the general sense I get from the analysis I've seen out there. But our speakers today are going to look at these questions and analyze the significance of the positive outcomes and uh, the shortcomings of the elections, as well as address, I hope, the broader question of why reforms are so critical for Jordan's uh, stability um, and well-being. Uh, we're going to start with Leslie Campbell, who's going to give an assessment of the elections uh, in Jordan. Les has had 25 years of experience in international development, uh, parliamentary governance, and political affairs. He has directed NDI's uh, Middle East and North Africa program since 1996, and during that time has overseen a vast expansion of NDI's Middle East work. Uh, and for more uh, detailed bios, they're on your um, information sheet. Danya will follow. Uh, she is the Deputy Director of the Rafiq Hariri Center for the Middle East at the Atlantic Council. She's a democracy and governance specialist with extensive experience in the MENA region. Uh, prior to joining the Atlantic Council, she uh, worked at um, the Center for uh, International Private Enterprise uh, as a program officer um, for the Middle East and North Africa. Um, I'm delighted to have you both here, and uh, let's begin with Les. And there are waters here on the table. Good morning or good afternoon, and thank you very much, uh, Kate, and to the Middle East Institute for having us. Um, I will try to uh, stick for now to sort of the more technical aspects of the election and sort of describe the election and, and, and leave uh, Danya to do some of the analysis, although I can't help but do a little bit, so I'll, I'll, but I'll, I'll try not to uh, steal all, your, uh, all the fun stuff. But, um, one of the, I should mention, uh, as Kate said, that uh, Donnie and I just came back from an international observer mission organized by NDI with funding from the United States government, USAID. Um, there were other delegations in Jordan as well. Our sister organization, the International Republican Institute, had a delegation as well. There, were, there was a group from the European Union. Uh, Arab League had a small uh, group. Um, and. Um, I'm trying to think, do you remember others? There are a few other, I think, you know, more, um, you know, less uh, organized ones. Uh, there was a lot of coordination among the delegations, particularly NDI, IRI, and the EU. Um, we all have offices and permanent um, uh, operations there. So one thing I want to say, sometimes there's an accusation of election observation that it's uh, sort of tourism. You fly in, fly out, you don't really see very much. Um, I don't think that necessarily applies to, to this case. Um, certainly, I hope it doesn't apply to NDI um, ever in the sense that we do election observation in countries where we have programs generally and where we have a long-term presence. And we see election observation 
as um, as uh, you know complementing or helping our other programs. You know, we're 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 in Jordan because we're trying to um, prod and promote more political change, positive reform. And when elections come along, it's a moment um, where the system. Uh, opens up whether people want it to open up or not. You know, so for for a short period of time, because you have political competition, you have parties, and you have um, openness to outside observation and so on. It's a great moment to um, either to promote further change, or even if if you can't do that, you can at least kind of get a glimpse at the inner workings of the country. And so I think, in a, in a sense, that's what we what we got during this election, and and that's what we're sharing with you. Um, one of the members of our delegation, uh, Jorge Quiroga, former president of Bolivia, um, you know, very smart guy, very analytical, um, came at this from the perspective of the problems that a, a small developing country has, like Bolivia. So he doesn't, you know, he doesn't hold countries up to some sort of unattainable standard. He's realistic in what he's looking at. Um, we're also joined by the uh, chairman of the election commission in Nigeria. This is a guy who, during election times, has more than 75,000 staff working for him, so he kind of understood what it took to, to run an election. But th they agreed that uh, that King Abdullah um, probably went into this election trying to accomplish three things. Um, one was to have the elections be run and be perceived to run uh, better than before. There were elections in 2009-2007 uh, were widely criticized for shortcomings, um, and uh, you know, I was there in 2009. I'm not sure they were as bad as some people think, but often elections are criticized more later on. They sort of get worse every day after they happen. Especially the losers think they're worse after they happen. So by now, it's become sort of mythical that the last election was terrible. Um, so he 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 was under some pressure to to have a better election. Um, secondly, as many of you will know that follow Jordan. The, the, the debate in Jordan wasn't really about who would win. Normally in elections, it's a horse race. You know, it's, you know, is this party going to win or that party was going to win? That was never the case in Jordan because of the system, which really is about individuals. So there was never going to be a headline that said, you know, this group wins, that group loses. That was never going to happen. But, it, but the, the subtext of the election, though, was the king versus the Islamic Action Front, um, the king versus to some extent, uh, Jordanians of Palestinian origin, East Bank versus West Bank, um, was sort of a subtext. And the way that that was playing out was that the Islamic Action Front um, was calling for a boycott. They're, you know, they were nonviolent. They were doing it in a way that I think is legitimate. They're saying, look, we're a political force here. We're going to ask our people to stay home. Um, and so it became a kind of a political competition between the king and the Islamic Action Front, would people actually stay home? You know, would would they sort of vote with their feet by not going? Would that would that embarrass the king? And then finally, and these are the things that we're looking at as an election um, observation group. You know, w was the election going to be run well uh, or better? You know, what what was the turnout? Was that credible? And then finally, um, and this is maybe what Daniel will talk about more is I think the third thing at stake in this election was um, to steal from the Clinton campaign of, a, of quite a few years ago, change versus more of the same. You know, was, was this election going to usher in change, or was this simply more of the same, and maybe will we see the next parliament dissolved early, and maybe another set of early elections, and maybe another set of reforms. Um, and just, just to sort of telegraph what I'm going to say, I would argue um, it, and, and, you know, I'm not sure the king, King Abdullah, would say this was his agenda, but I would say it was. It, I think the king won on two out of three. I think in terms of integrity and being administered better, it was administered better. There was more integrity. Um, I'll talk more about that. In, turn, in turnout, turnout was, uh, I think, surprisingly high um, or higher than expected. Let's put it that way. So probably a win there. But on the third one, change versus more of the same. Um, it was a, a loser, and I think we'll talk about that now. So I'll go in the first part, the administration, the integrity of the election. Uh, one of the main improvements, and by the way, um, I did, we did bring copies of NDI's preliminary statement on the election, left them on the check-in table. I don't know if there's some left, but if there are, if they're not, they're on our website. Um, one of the main improvements was the creation of an independent election commission. And that, I think, went well. And uh, the, the chairman of the commission, Khatib is his name, um, I think um, performed amazingly well. Actually, he's a former foreign minister. He's, uh, 
had a long career. He didn't have a lot to prove. But then again, he didn't have a lot to lose either. So he had a lot of confidence. You know, he seemed to be quite confident in, in what he was doing. And I think he, he's close to the king, so I think he had a lot of power because of that. So the election, Independent Election Commission is always a recommendation that we make. It's, it's the best way of running elections. You don't want the elections run by the Interior Ministry as they were in the past. So that was good. If there was a downside, it was that they didn't really have the staff to manage a whole election, so they had to rely on seconded staff, many of them from the Interior Ministry. So you can't say that the Interior Ministry was out of the election business, but it was an improvement to have a confident, powerful head of the Election Commission. And, and he was very receptive to uh, recommendations and to the international observers' uh, comments and so on throughout the process. Other improvements, big improvement, a pre-printed standardized ballot which was a first in Jordan. Previous Jordanian elections, people actually had to write, hand write in. They just got a blank piece of paper and they would write in the name of the candidate they wanted. And that was, that caused huge problems. Um, I mean, if, if there was fraud in, in Jordan, that's where it came because, um, and that's where a lot of vote buying came in because th that meant that, you know, one of the biggest things that people used to do was claimed to be illiterate, I can't write, I need my helper, and then the helper would be someone maybe from the candidate's family or something, and they could confirm that they voted the right way, or people would write and say, oh, is this, you know, is this correct, uh, you know, and show it to people in the polling station, or they would ask the polling people to help them or something. I mean, it just gave them ten different ways of kind of playing with the process when you had to write it in um, that allowed them to well, the other thing that they could do, which, you know, it's hard to see as an observer, but we're told happened many times, is because it's just a blank piece of paper, um, you could do something, I forget what they call it, it's kind of like sequential balloting. You, you have one filled out already um, and when you come in, and you sort of substitute for the other one. Anyway, I won't go through it, but there, it gave many w ways of cheating. Pre-printed ballot, this time, they had two ballots, a national ballot for proportional representation, and a ballot for the local um, individual member seats. Um, <clears throat> but it was like what you normally see. It had logos, pictures, names of the parties. You had to fill in uh, a mark. Uh, the Election Commission did something good and said, even though the law said write in, they, they um, decided to interpret that very broadly, and writing could include any kind of mark. So if you made a mark beside the person you wanted, that counted. So that was a big improvement. And it was actually harder to cheat. Um, because it was standardized, there were um, serial numbers on the ballots, they were uh, accounted for, you didn't just have a white piece of paper. Um, they assigned, I won't spend a lot of time on these other things because they're, they're important technically, but they're kind of boring and they make sense. They assigned voters to specific polling stations before you could actually move around to different places depending on wh you know, where you lived, where your an ancestral village was, if you, you, know, you had different ways of moving around and that made it harder to track people. Um, they had uh, better voting procedures and they posted results at the ind individual polling stations. Again, in election observation, if, if the system uh, may, has people, has the polling officials at 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. When the, when the voting closes, if they immediately take the ballot box, which are clear and people have watched them all day, and open them up and count the ballots in front of everybody right there and then, and then write down the results, and everyone can copy those results. This is how it happened in Jordan. And then they even post them on, on the door. If, um, if there are enough observers around, and, or you know, the parties or the, the candidate representatives are there, and if they have any kind of organization, they'll know the results right away. And so there were domestic election observation organizations um, supported by NDI, supported by the Europeans and others, that had the ability to do a statistical sample. They did do a, what they call parallel vote tabulation. And they, they did get these results. They uh, sent them in through SMS messages to a central database. And what one of the groups, two of the groups actually, followed the national vote. They had this na one national ballot, which I'll explain in a second. And they instantaneously got the results. And that's how they were able to verify the turnout figures. They, and, and we found independently checking with these groups that their statistically estimated turnout figures were within one-tenth of a percentage point of the eventual official announcement. So this makes, you can check different ways. You can check against, um, you know, the results that people can get right in. The, so that, that takes away a lot of the chances of cheating as well. Um, there are also, <clears throat> for the first time this time, ways of challenging results through, through the courts. Um, on election day, we found 
the materials were present, that the polling staff were well trained, they were doing their jobs well. I mean, there are all sorts of exceptions to this. I mean, there are lots of places where by the end of the day things broke down. There were, you know, where, where there was pressure, where the tension started to rise, the polling station staff kind of withdrew. They, they were not willing to challenge um, strong or, or potentially violent uh, people. And there were some around that were, that were sort of intimidating them. And so they, they have to, the polling staff have to improve, but generally speaking, uh, maybe you could, I, I'll say maybe their hearts were in the right place. They, they were trying to do a good job, and they did a good job, except where they weren't, you know, where they didn't have the, the power or the authority, or they didn't feel that they had the authority to maybe clamp down on some bad behavior, especially by the end of the day. Um, shortcomings, so those are all positive things. Shortcomings um, are long-standing shortcomings in, in Jordan. The unequal size of districts and then the electoral system um, were really were shortcomings. And so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that briefly because uh, I think Donnie will end up talking about this more. Um, the, the way the Jordanian system works uh, is you have multiple, I guess you'd call them multiple member constituencies and something called a single non-transferable vote. Um, in short, because it would take a long time to explain it, uh, you, even though you may have multiple candidates running in your general area, and they, they may have, say, in a, in a bigger area of Amman, five seats, you could only cast one vote for one candidate. And the complaint about that is that it leads to non-proportional results. It, 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 it causes big um, anomalies in the number of votes that it takes to be elected. Um, and also in the Jordanian context, people complain a lot that they're under a lot of pressure to vote for family members or people within the clan or the tribe, and they feel that they have to do that, and then they, they, they don't have the ability to cast a vote for someone that they might agree with ideologically or they might even think they're just more qualified. So what a, a lot of Jordanians have been arguing for years for a system, you could have a system where you cast multiple votes, for example. It's very common, actually. If you have multiple seats, you can cast multiple votes and then it's tabulated later and the, you know, the largest vote-getters still get these seats. Or you could go to a, a different system of proportional representation. Or you could go back to a more individual district system, but make sure that the delineation of the boundaries is, is more equitable. You're never going to get equal. I mean, in every country there's going to be a difference between rural areas and urban areas. But in Jordan, and I brought um, one example of the, actually the votes cast, um, just as, as an example, this is a bit extreme, but in the first district of Amman, um, it took 19,000 votes to be elected in the first district. Uh, but in, and again, I'm using an extreme example just to make the point, in, a, in an area that uh, you, you would consider tribal man, which is, uh, um, often has uh, you know, tribal conflict and so on, in the second district, um, you could be elected with uh, 1,600 votes. So 19,000 votes versus 1,600. Um, again, that's, that's an extreme one, but it, it goes to show that the system um, en ends up over-representing the rural areas, the more tribal areas. And if you have to go out and get 19,000 votes and you, you're you know, running against five other people, that's a much harder, more expensive, more difficult thing than if you just have you know, 1,600 votes in a rural area that literally would be all the people with the same last name. Um, and that's exactly how it works. They'd have the same, you know, the same last name, vote for the family member and win. So the, the system causes uh, the, these distortions. Um, what I, the reason I mention this, and, and I'm going to end in a, in a, in a minute or two to, to let uh, Donny go, but um, I, I'm going to read what, what, why we thought this was a problem and why as election observers we thought this was important to talk about. We talked about shortcomings. The unequal size of districts in an electoral system that amplifies family, tribal, and national cleavages, which is what I was just mentioning, that, that you could you know, get, get a whole family, get a tribe together, and really dominate certain areas. But in other areas, you had to run a real campaign, spend money, try to convince people. Um, it limits the development of a truly national um, a legislative body, and challenges King Abdullah's stated aim of encouraging, quote, full parliamentary government. Why? Because even with the, the new list system, which I guess I, I haven't explained yet, but I will, um, the, the parliament's made up of really 150 individuals. Each one is beholden only 
to their family or tribe or, or you know, very hyper-local concerns. And it's going to be difficult for them to form any kind of block. If you have parliamentary government, if you don't have blocks of some sort, it, it, maybe they don't have to be party, but interest groups or regional groups, people that say, okay, we don't have 150 seats, but we have 30, and we can control th these 30, so therefore we think we should put forward a person for a leadership position, a speakership or, or prime ministership or something, and we can make sure that that program gets through because we'll take our 30 votes and we'll add, you know, 30 more and we, you know, have a majority, et cetera. Um, in Jordan, that's virtually impossible. So, uh, of course, if nobody is in charge uh, in the parliament, then that means that the king and the, and the royal palace, in a sense, can do what they want because they're the only ones with the ability to put forward a policy position that has some kind of, you know, oomph behind it. They're the only ones that can, can, you know, maybe gather because they have the ability to dispense patronage and so on. They can actually gather enough people to, to get their agenda through. So it's pretty ha hard to have full parliamentary government in a, in a gathering of individuals where, where even in the, par in the proportional seats, the largest single group only got three seats. Um, so we said the elections are a series of profoundly local contests where candidates are elected as service providers and representatives of parochial interests rather than national legislators able to hold the executive branch to account or propose laws. And we said if King Abdullah is to give concrete expression to his promise to involve the parliament in the naming of the prime minister and the formation of the government, he will also have to work to unite individuals and groups in pursuit of national policies and agendas and, and encourage the formation of like-minded coalitions. So our point was, to, to summarize, this was a better process. It was handled well by an independent commission. Um, your workers behaved with integrity and professionalism. Uh, there were different systems from before that, that if they were used properly by the contestants could give more confidence. People should, could be, I don't know if they are confident, but if this went on for a few more elections, they should be confident that their vote will be counted properly. And, and that's all very, very positive. But in terms of the sort of change versus more of the same scenario, um, electing uh, a parliament of individuals, uh, let me just pull out, I had got some statistics last night about how it worked out in the end. Electing a parliament where um, I think 17, and correct me if I'm wrong, 17 of the people that put forward lists, there was a, a group of 27 seats to be cited on a national level based on proportional representation. And the idea was that was of, of, of it to was encourage parties but it didn't encourage parties. It meant that just individuals put together their list where they were number one on the list, and I think only three of those got more than one seat. So 15, roughly, or 14 individuals got seats using the national proportional party list system. So you have 150 individuals. Um, no, that's the bad part. The good part is 34 members of parliament are of Palestinian origin this time as opposed to 19 last time. And this goes to what I said about the IAF versus the king. I think the king kind of came out on top because the idea that, that, that Jordanians of Palestinian origin were not participating turned out to not be true. Um, the uh, group uh, Wasat al-Islami, um, you know, moderate or middle Islamic party, uh, came in first in the national uh, proportional list with three seats. They could, the moderate Islamists could have a block of 15 to 20 seats. Um, of the 150 seats this time, only 33 of the parliamentarians come from the previous parliament, which I think is good. And then progressive, reform-minded members of parliament, this is according to our subjective interpretation, could form a block of maybe 30. And when you have this much fragmentation, 30 is a big deal. You know, if you, if you can keep 30 people together, they can be very, very powerful. Um, so those are all good things. The bad things is that uh, you're going to still see the, you know, Palestinian or West Bank versus East Bank uh, divisions in Jordan through the parliament. There is a reformist versus traditional um, kind of element in the parliament, so you st and the traditionalists are still a majority. Um, and then finally, and I'll, I'll end on this because maybe this will segue into Danya's talk, is that um, even though King Abdullah said we'll form the government with reference to the parliamentary election or something along, something vague along that line. Um, and, and there were a lot of expectations. 
that now, you know, the parliamentarians could choose a speaker or they could maybe have a lot of input into the prime ministership. They are meeting as we speak about the speakership and about the prime minister and the government formation. But we're hearing through MPs that there is, quote, severe intelligence interference in their preliminary talks on these things. So as the groups get together, they're not really free to meet behind closed doors and sort of make a decision and then say, okay, this is our consensus. You know, we, we think that we want to put these people forward, sorry, as, as, our, as our choices. I think they have intelligence um, uh, people in there saying, well, yeah, don't choose that person, choose that person, or, you know, maybe do it this way. And that's not really um, encouraging the formation of parliamentary government. So I'll end there and turn it over to Diane. Thank you. Let me take a seat here. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you, Kate, and to the Middle East Institute and to Les for outlining um, a great overview of the electoral process and what happened. The, the good thing about going second is you've already said everything, so I don't need to. The bad thing is you've already said everything, so I'll try to add to it a little bit. But um, in large part, I, I agree completely with the assessment that, you know, out of two out of those three major points, I think the kingdom did quite well on. And on that last point, um, I want to just go back a couple months and offer a little bit of context about why that was such a critical point, why that was such a disappointment. Um, and then I just want to touch on what the elections told us, what they didn't tell us, and what we should be watching for in the weeks and the months to come. Um, just, to, just to go back, in, um, in October of this past year, the new election law was passed, and that came after a long process of negotiation and, and consultation about what a new electoral law should look like. And this came within the, the construct of a, a national dialogue or national committee um, representing a cross-section of Jordanians from, from various political stripes. They came up with what I understand to be a very credible, very good uh, a draft of a revised electoral law. It was then sent to Parliament to be considered. It sat there for about a year. And when it was finally promulgated, it did not include the aspects of, uh, of, of fundamental reform that the committee had come up with. And I think this was a pivotal turning point, a pivotal moment when people started to feel or, or frustration started to mount of this more inherent intrinsic reform to the electoral system is not forthcoming. And what it did was uh, sustain the status quo that, that Les outlined um, particularly in terms of the disproportionate representation from district to district and the, the one-vote system that people were, were quite um, unhappy with. And because those two elements were sustained, that essentially left in place um, the status quo. The, the major change was the introduction of this national list that Les mentioned, the 27 seats out of 150 that were meant to be selected on a, a proportional basis, on a national basis. Um, but for the reasons that, that he outlined, it tended to uh, incentivize lists to be formed by um, tribal elites, by, by local prominent individuals, by businessmen, as opposed to coalescing around um, a political party or, or a coherent electoral platform. So in that sense, uh, I, I definitely agree with the assessment that the election itself was run uh, far better than it had been in the past. Um, but unfortunately, the, the fundamental basis of the electoral system returns a parliament that is uh, likely to resemble the previous parliament in terms of its scope of action, in terms of um, the type of candidates uh, that, that will now be sitting in, in parliament. Um, taking a step back, looking at the elections now that the dust has settled and, and there have been um, you know, certainly some contentious claims about candidates who lost, who were unhappy with that, and I think at this point, the results are, are fairly widely accepted. Um, so what can we try and understand and, and glean from, from the playing field now? Um, there are five things that I would pull away out of this. Um, the first is that tribal loyalties still dominate the electoral process. The uh, turnout rate that the, uh, the um, Independent Election Commission um, has, has been um, you know, released and then was corroborated by these independent monitoring groups of 56.6%, um, I think really attest to the fact that tribal networks and tribal loyalties and, and clan and, and family ties really motivated people to the polls. This, I think, was the dominant motivating factor, as it has been in the past. Um, 
candidates did not campaign based on uh, political platforms or ideology. And those who entered the race uh, were actually often determined by the tribes themselves in advance and in a sort of informal uh, primary system. Not actually even all that informal, pretty, pretty formal and pretty um, rigorous. So that it really was very much about um, how the tribes wanted to present themselves to the public and who they wanted to put forward. The second is that apathy about politics, uh, parliament, and polls is still quite widespread. Um, when you look at voter turnout relative to the uh, percentage of registered voters, it's 56.6%. If you look at it relative to the number of eligible voters, it's closer to 40%. And given the context of the Arab awakening and, and voting voter turnout rates in neighboring countries, this is actually quite low. This is meant to be the culmination of a reform process. 40% doesn't really attest to um, a lot of interest. And I think that that is a statement that most Jordanians don't see the reform process as, as being meaningful. Um, and that, that in essence, the, the political dynamism and the enthusiasm to participate um, that we've seen in Tunisia and Egypt and, and Libya, for better or for worse, of what's going on there, um, has largely bypassed Jordanians for the most part. Um, the third is that the opposition calls for a boycott largely fell flat. This is the point that Les mentioned, the sort of um, competition or, or struggle for, for um, uh, popular support between the palace and, and the Muslim Brotherhood and its party affiliate, the um, Islamic Action Front. Um, they had, you know, forcefully been calling for a boycott. And I, I kept asking when, when we were there during the uh, election observation about how will we know whether or not the boycott has actually had an impact? How will we know if those who don't go to the polls, is it because they're apathetic or because they're boycotting? And I kept asking this question over and over again, and, and it's hard to distill. But um, I, I was able to get some information, um, survey research and focus groups that were conducted by both lo local and international civil society groups that estimated about 2 to 5% of registered voters had indicated prior to polling that, um, that they would be boycotting sort of with intention as opposed to staying home from the polls out of disinterest. That's a pretty low percentage given the strength that the IAF generally has in the streets. The Friday before the election, they called for a protest or demonstration um, to advance the, the call of the boycott and only 2,000 people showed up. That's compared with about 15,000 that showed up for their previous protest in, I think, October or November. So clearly this call for, for boycotting was, was not very salient. It wasn't very motivational. And I think, again, that just goes back to the fact that most people are making decisions about whether or not to vote um, based on their tribal affinity. Um, the other wing of opposition um, is the sort of youth East Banker movement um, known as the Hadak movements, which are not organized into a cohesive, coherent movement, but rather are, you know, a series of very localized protest movements. There's probably a Harak movement or Harak group in every town or city across the country. Um, and they initially had also been calling for a boycott. And as I understand, um, that also largely fell flat. And in fact, some of them campaigned for candidates and some of them ran as candidates. So this idea that there was going to be a Harak and IAF consolidated uh, boycott did, did not play out. Um, part of that attests to um, number four, something that Les also mentioned, which is that political parties uh, lack um, strong political constituencies and are largely irrelevant. Um, other than the IEF and perhaps this, the Wasat, the uh, Islamist centrist party, um, political parties play very little role in Jordan. This is something that the government and the king has, has talked about and, and wants to encourage. Um, and yet at the same time, this election did not necessarily move that process along. Um, the introduction of the, natu the national list, which was this proportional list of, uh, to select 27 out of the 150 seats, was meant to foster um, a resurgence or, or a growth of, of political party life within parliament. Um, but because of the way it was designed and structured, I won't go into the details, um, but it's in the, the issue brief that we've been, uh, that I wrote that's being distributed. Um, the way that it was constructed essentially incentivized, um, again, individuals to form a list 
with their name at the top and a bunch of other people, um, but not necessarily grouped around a particular platform or, or a party. Um, so unfortunately, that, that did not help um, deepen the political party culture. Of the 61 lists that competed, 17 won seats. Of those, as Les mentioned, I think one list got three seats, two lists got two seats, and the rest of the list only got one seat. Um, and, and so th these are, you know, again, individuals um, elected based on their individual appeal. Um, what the elections don't tell us, they don't tell us the degree of support for the Muslim Brotherhood or the IEF because they didn't participate. Um, they weren't able to mobilize a large proportion of the electorate to boycott, but that doesn't necessarily indicate a drop in popularity. I think that that speaks to a couple other factors, which I'll touch on. Um, the IAF is still the largest political party. They're really the only organized opposition force. The Hedok movements have not um, galvanized together to create a, a party in that same sense. And um, it's estimated that if they were to participate in the future in a, a fair election with more equitable districting and distribution, that they would probably gain 20 to 25 percent of the seats. So. Um, this, this sort of confrontation between the Muslim Brotherhood and, and the palace um, was, was not avoided but was postponed. And I think that's something um, that might potentially reemerge that, that we should be watching for. The other thing I think the elections didn't tell us is public opinion or public support for the king's reform agenda. Um, there were many um, statements in advance and the palace, I think, tried to cast the election as being a barometer of support for, um, for the vision that the king has put forward and, and for his efforts. But since most cast their votes based on tribal affinity and loyalties and family ties and, and, and local issues, um, I, I think it would be quite difficult to take the degree of turnout as any sort of indicator or comment on that. And if anything, again, if you take the 40% voter turnout rate relative to those who are eligible to vote, um, I would say that the low turnout would actually suggest that Jordanians are still quite disappointed with the gap between the very high expectations that were raised in the wake of um, you know, the Arab Spring and, and, and higher expectations about political participation and then what's actually been delivered on the ground. And, and this gap, I think, is felt very palpably. I was there in October as well as a, um, a pre-election assessment actually with the International Republican Institute and uh, everyone that we spoke to was conveying the sense of, of real disappointment and frustration. This is among the political elite but, but still this is, this is where, where the feeling was at that point and I think that that played out. Um, you know, I think that, that there's been a great deal of discussion about the reform agenda and I think um, many of the right things have been said but they have yet to be delivered and so there's a sense that this is uh, still at the rhetorical level and has not been implemented in, in tangible and practical ways. So in the coming weeks and months, what, what should we be looking for? And I want to touch on um, a couple points that, that Les mentioned that I think will be critical. Um, one is that, again, taking a step back and, and looking at this within the context of the region, um, Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I want to go back to one thing that I did not mention that's actually very important because um, I, was, I was quite struck by this when we were there. Um, the degree that the regional context has an impact on Jordanians and how they view themselves and, and their country where they're at vis-a-vis -vis their neighbors. And this is particularly important in terms of what's happening in Syria. Um, almost everyone that I spoke to expressed great concern and fear about spillover of violence from Syria. There's obviously a lot of pressure from, from refugees, there's economic pressure and social pressure from that. Um, but it also, I think, prompted a feeling of taking a step back and looking at Jordan and its limitations and, and, and feeling, you know, maybe this isn't such a bad situation. And I think that combined with um, hesitancy about instability in Syria as well as looking at the ascendancy of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and the somewhat autocratic behavior of, of President Morsi and instability in Libya. Um, all of this has contributed to a general feeling among Jordanians of a sense of pause and let's just um, maybe take a step back. And I think that this actually ended up buying King Abdullah some time 
and some breathing room that he didn't have, let's say, in October. Um, the, the sense was, was quite different. And I, I think it ended up um, bringing about in, in many Jordanians a feeling of, of greater tolerance of where Jordan stands vis-a-vis -vis, um, its neighbors and also um, less willingness to actively oppose the regime and, and sort of join opposition or street, street protests and street movements. So again, I think this has, has bought um, King Abdullah and the palace some, some breathing room and some space, but that will not continue indefinitely. Um, in addition to this regional context, in terms of things to watch, obviously if, if things you know, do spill over in terms of um, violent conflict within Jordan's borders, that will have uh, y you know, <laughs> a huge impact on, on how Jordanians are feeling. Um, I'm not going to speculate about what I think will happen in, in Syria, but other than to say that this is on the forefront of, of everyone's mind there. It's very much a, a palpable fear um, that, that, was, that was quite obvious to me. Um, the other major factor that, that wasn't really discussed a lot in the election, but is probably the most important thing, are the economic pressures and challenges that, that Jordanians face and that this new government will face. Um, the economic frustration, the rising costs of basic commodities and basic goods, and rampant corruption were the main drivers of the protest movements for the past two years. And none of these three things have been addressed in any real way. In fact, they'll probably get worse. And just um, last night, another round of fuel hikes, um, price hikes in, in fuel um, was implemented. And based on the Jordanian government's agreement with the IMF for financial support, there are also likely to be electricity price hikes that will probably happen in the next couple of weeks. So the combination of the lifting of these subsidies and the increase in cost in, in, um, in, in, in basic commodities is going to is going to place greater pressure on Jordanians that have already been feeling this. Um, and and I, I would anticipate that this could potentially um, prompt also another sort of wave of protests um, that could potentially turn violent. So the economic pressures are one thing to watch. The regional environment with Syria is one thing to watch. Um, the third is the selection of the prime minister and the formulation of the new government. This is a critical moment um, for, I think, the king to demonstrate his sincerity and, and a real commitment and political will to this reform agenda. He has laid out in a series of discussion papers um, more detail about this vision. And the second discussion paper specifically addressed the development of a full and robust um, parliamentary system based on political party life um, that was quite compelling and, and quite um, inspiring. And if some of that is actually put into place, I think that um, there, is a, there is a great deal of potential for some renewed um, faith and confidence in what he's trying to do. Um, I think that that confidence had evaporated because of the electoral law and the lack of depth of, of real systemic reform. This is another opportunity, another opening. Um, whether or not um, how that plays out, I think, remains to be seen. And as Les has just indicated from, the, from this report from yesterday, the um, potential influence of the security and intelligence forces in the selection of who will be prime minister and how the government will be formed um, could have a very negative effect. So there's, there's huge potential, but I, it remains to be seen how that's going to play out. And again, the, the document, the discussion paper, I think specifically the language, at least in English, is that the prime minister will be selected in consultation with the largest uh, political party or parliamentary bloc. What that means is unclear. Who's going to consult? How is, it, uh, you know, how is this person going to be selected? Um, all of these details remain to be seen, and, and that's what we should be watching for. Um, the other piece to watch is the third of the discussion papers will focus on, as I understand, the roles and responsibilities of various government institutions. And specifically, I think the balance of power between uh, the parliament and the executive. And if there is a transference or devolution of some of the power that, that the king has held in the executive to the parliament and to parliamentary bodies, um, that again would um, send a very clear signal that, this, um, that, that King Abdullah is serious about um, ushering in greater, greater reform and, and greater decision-making opportunities for, for the Jordanian public and, and citizens through their elected members. Um, 
you know, as, as it is now, Jordan's parliament has, uh, is very constrained and very limited in terms of what it can do to actually address some of the most critical issues um, and has, has not taken a very strong role in terms of um, dealing with corruption cases that have come to the parliament. And um, if there is a, a greater movement um, to actually address some of these issues, I think it would go a long way in instilling greater confidence. Um, I will stop there because I think there's probably questions and that would be more interesting than listening to me go on, but thank you. Thank you, Danya. And Les, Les, why don't you join Danya at the podium? It's very refreshing to get that level of insight into Jordan. Um, we have a lot of people and only about 15 minutes left. I'm going to hold my questions um, in order to give other people a chance. For those of you in the overflow room, we have question cards. You can give them to an intern and pass them up. And I think I'm going to bundle questions for the sake of time. And then, you know, either one of you can take the questions that seem appropriate. So um, let's begin with the first question. We'll start with you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if I have the liberty to make a couple of comments, if that's okay, before I make <laughs> a question. Very, brief, though, we have very quickly, uh, just a, a quick comment on uh, what has been said by our esteemed guests. Welcome back from Jordan. Uh, my first remark is I don't think that the, the Jordanian state has alienated the Islamic powers. Actually, since the uh, formation of the National Dialogue Committee, there has been multiple attempts to include them, as actually they were part of the Jordanian political scene since 1947. The second issue is that uh, regarding tribalism in Jordan, it's difficult to exclude the fact that Jordan, democratically speaking, is made by units which are located all around the country, basically, of tribes. So how is it possible to create districts at the same time alienate the tribal presence? The uh, third issue I want to, uh, to discuss here is uh, the, the fact that reforms are not over, that the uh, elections, recent elections, are simply one stop in a long process towards more and more reforms. Therefore, when we talk about the current electoral law, it's not the final draft that we will adopt. All the countries around the world continue to improve their electoral laws. My question is, when you say, uh, Dania, when you say that, <laughs> that, <laughs> that reforms are disappointing, would you please explain to me what is the canvas that you use to contrast these reforms to? Is it regional? I hope not. Thank you. Thank you. Well, she might point to Morocco. Um, <coughs> Thanks uh, very much for a uh, very detailed uh, presentation. I'd like to uh, look at uh, this in the larger uh, context as uh, Dania was, uh, sorry, was uh, doing. Given that the uh, Majlis is really almost uh, powerless uh, to affect uh, policy and that doesn't seem to be uh, changing, even with the uh, so-called uh, consolidation. I wonder how much reform the uh, king is interested in uh, doing or uh, capable of uh, doing. He's set forth his reform uh, agenda, but I think both he and his father have been uh, expert <coughs> at really uh, promising reform and then not really uh, carrying uh, through. Given the very severe uh, protests, the uh, strongest since uh, 89, I'd say, do you see any reason to uh, believe the uh, king can and will accomplish a, uh, any uh, real part of uh, changing the structure and improving the uh, dire economic uh, situation. Uh, yeah, I'm actually interested in hearing your opinion about uh, the issue of youth participation in the elections. I've been following this social media campaign, which I think they ripped off the Cleveland Indians logo. <laughs> The saying that uh, people between the ages of 18 and 28 are not allowed to run. So is this a social media phenomenon? Especially that recently a Jordanian uh, person has been appointed as spokesperson for, the, for Ban Ki-moon, for UN Security General. So 
Are the youth being represented, or is the king interested in hearing the opinion of the young generation, which I think uh, might be uh, away from the Palestinian-Jordanian East Bank-West Bank dichotomy? Thank you. Okay, well, let, let's stop for a moment. Um, do you want to take the question of the model and also uh, if sure. Abella is ready sure, to reform? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'll take the easy yeah. ones. <laughs> um, I appreciate your, your comments and, and your question. I should preface by saying um, when I comment that the reforms are disappointing, that's actually not my assessment. That's the assessment of the many Jordanians that I spoke to. And I think the barometer is really an internal or the, the scope of comparison is not, it's certainly not international. I don't think it's even regional. I think it's a, a disappointment relative to the expectations that Jordanians had for what they would see happen in their country. So it's not a it's not a model that I'm superimposing on the country and then trying to assess and make benchmark statements about where they are. This is purely a reflection on, you know, countless conversations that I had with political activists, civil society activists, political party leaders, journalists, academics um, in in Jordan, assessing their own context. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, in, in terms of you know, is the king really um, willing to do this, that, that's, um, I, I think that's the $64,000 question. Uh, no one really knows. Um, and I think that's, that's why I was trying to um, sort of demarcate several things to watch for that will help us understand whether or not there's um, a real sense of political will and commitment to do that and a real desire to do that. As, as you pointed out, the parliament is, is limited and doesn't necessarily have the ability to Impo you know, to, to, um, to push forward the kind of reform that, that many Jordanians want to see. And so if the powers um, are enhanced in Parliament, if the king is ready and willing to do that, then, then I think that's an indicator. Um, I just wanted to make one also comment about youth, um, just to convey a, a great conversation that I had with a youth activist who is part of one of the Hedok movements, and we were talking about youth participation and and where, where was it, and, and, and he was saying, you know, some of my friends are voting, some of them aren't, and, and I said, on, I asked on what basis are they voting? Um, all of them were voting for either cousins or family members or someone that they knew personally. That was what was motivating them to the polls. But the thing that he also told me is that they're in the process right now of setting up a youth parliament um, on Facebook as a parallel sort of shadow government that will operate um, in tandem with the parliament and try and activate youth and try and get them involved. So I think that there's a sense that youth have been left out um, in, some, in some ways and they're trying to make their voices heard and I think that's mostly through the Hedok movements. That's why they've gained so much attention. Um, I, I absolutely think there's a willingness and an eagerness on the part of the government as well to engage and to talk with youth. There were, I think, 4,000 youth volunteers that were part of, that worked with the election commission, um, many of whom I saw in the polling stations that were eager and excited to be there and wanted to contribute to their country. So I think there's an, there's an interest among some and, and that should be nurtured as much as possible. Les? Um, well, just briefly, I think just to echo Donnie's point on the sort of the bar that's being set, um, I think that as, as international observers or even um, democracy organizations, um, we're setting, we're, we, we were trying to set the bar lower than the government and the king himself. I mean, just for example, um, Donnie was on a pre-election mission. I was part of a pre-election group in, in November as well. And we said privately, the government officials, why exactly have an election? Um, who, who, who's pushing for that? You know, I said, we're an election observation organization. And if you said, you know, the timing's not great for an election and, and we'll not have it, we wouldn't, we would say, okay, that makes sense. I mean, we wouldn't be saying have it. And, and the parliament was dissolved prematurely. Um, you know, so, and then, you know, I had a whole round table in November with heads of political parties. And, uh, you know, we were saying, what exactly are you, are you trying to accomplish? And they couldn't really name it, you know. So I don't think that we're imposing any particular high bar or anything. But having said that, a, a, an anecdote, um, <clears throat> which I think is interesting, the day of the election, just about the meaning of all this and, and whether or not the, the government is serious about change, and this maybe goes to your question about what, what can happen, any real change. The headline of the Jordan Times, um, big headline, on the day of the election was government um, releases five-year anti-poverty plan. Now typically, and that's a big policy, 
typically an anti-poverty plan in, in a democratic country would be run by the parliament and approved by the parliament it would, because otherwise it won't kind of take. But so the day there, there, there's going to be this quote new important mm -hmm. parliament elected, a five-year plan is released. As Donnie mentioned, a week after the election, the prices the IMF kind of imposed prices go up. So that, what a message. So okay, you just elected this really important um, thing. These are your representatives. Oh, but by the way, we're changing the prices anyhow. Um, because they have nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with it. Um, and we know they have nothing to do with it. And they'll change the electricity prices mm -hmm. next week because the parliament has nothing to do with that either. Um, so anyway, I, I just mentioned that because it, it sends really weird messages. It says, we need your vote. Your vote's important. But you know what? For all the decisions, we're going to make them anyway. It doesn't matter what they say. So I think it's a problem. So any real change? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, actually, to go back to your point, only if Jordanians demand it. And, but I agree, Donnie said this, I think you're kind of saying this in a way, Jordan is the way it is for a reason. It's not without reason. And, and I think that there is reticence, there is sort of ambivalence about demanding too much change because they're looking at what's happening next door, several next doors actually, not yes. just one next door. Many and borders. saying that's not great either. So. So again, you know, we're not saying go crazy and do crazy things. Honestly, I'm not sure I would have gone as far as the king was going right now because what's the demand exactly? It's not really from us. Um, it's not really internal. Um, it's coming from, from something else. Just on youth real quick, one of the recommendations was to lower the age for candidacy to 18. If you, if you can vote at 18, you should be able to run at 18. It's, I think it it's, happens in a lot of Arab countries. You have to be 30 or more, and I don't understand that. So. Okay, let's try to squeeze in two or three last questions. There's a gentleman over here and the lady next to him. Sure. Um, thank, you very much. thank you very much for your presentation and welcome back from Jordan. Uh, my question is, um, well, recently the, the king uh, a couple times has stated that he wants to see Jordanians coalesce around two, three, or four political parties that represent left, right, and center. Um, after being on the ground in Jordan and speaking with, these, uh, with Jordanians, do you see this as something feasible in the next two to three years? Or if not, you know, how long would something like that take? Um, and, and then looking at parliament as it is now, is that something that would actually make a difference? Would that help uh, actual political representation in government? And would, that really, would the king really use these political parties in consultation of picking a prime minister? Is that something that will make a difference? Thank you. Um, it was just, thank you very much for your presentation. It was something that you mentioned, uh, Ms. Greenfield, uh, sorry, Mr. Campbell, that um, would, would these elections have happened if the Arab revolutions had not happened? Very simply. Um, hi, uh, I'm Catherine. And uh, in the 2012 political parties law, there was a stipulation that parties couldn't be formed on the basis of like tribal or religion or sect. Do you think that that was just words, or do you think that that's actually being implemented, since you were saying that a lot of the new political parties are formed on tribal alliance, and even a lot of the older political parties had either, like, in their name or in their um, kind of ideology, religious or sect or tribal overtones? You want to take the first step? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, on the formation of parties, the, the recommendation that we've made, because NDI also works on party strengthening and so on, is, um, is you can't mandate parties uh, to form. You can't, you, know, you can't engineer it. You can't say, we shall have this type of party and that type of party. Um, parties form when, there's, when there is the hope of power. I mean, the, the incentive is the idea of winning power. That's what parties exist for. Why do people band together into like-minded groups? Because they want to gain power and control decisions. And so I think Jordan has it sort of backwards. I think what you do is you make it clear that the parliament is going to be given genuine power, and then you'll very quickly see parties form because they'll realize that they have to put together like-minded groups to control the parliament. So they have to switch it around. I know the argument um, by, by the king and others would be, oh, well, we can't do that because that w you sort of get the unknown. You don't know who will win. Um, and th then I go to this question of would there be elections without the Arab Spring revolutions and, um, and even your question. I would argue there is demand for change in Jordan. It, it may be not exactly the same as in Egypt or, or Tunisia or whatever, but there is demand for change. But 
people are are willing to kind of go at it differently, um, or they're 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 willing to wait um, a little bit longer. But I think the trick, and and I don't think Jordan quite has hit the right tone yet. The trick is to understand that more of the same doesn't work. I mean, I, I personally think it was a mistake for Jordan's first post-Arab Spring election to, to be, um, I don't want to be too strong on this, to be you know, less meaningful than it could have been. Like, in other words, better to have no election than to have a, an election sort of devoid of too much meaning, because it would, it would disappoint people, and it doesn't sate the, the demand for change. So I think what the, what the Jordanian authorities are not quite figuring out is, I think they, I don't want to get it, I guess I'm not a psychologist. I think <laughs> there's a sense you can sort of kick the ball down the road, just delay another year, just kind of buy time, get some breathing room, things will settle down. I don't mean to cast aspersions because I have a lot of admiration for what they're doing and for all the things they have to juggle. It's tough. But you could look at it differently and say, you know what, we can't escape these demands. We have to come up with something meaningful. Elections are not necessarily the answer, maybe it's part of the answer. And I don't think they've come up with that right formulation yet. So. Daniel, do you want to add to anything? Actually, I think that I think that really well captured it. Um, the, the the only two small things I would add in terms of you know what would it take to sort of instill a, a stronger political party system and culture, um, I, I think is revising the electoral law again so that districts are actually equal and equitable and um, and people feel that they have a greater stake and that who they elect would actually have some authority to make some decisions. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is um, moving more towards proportional representation and increasing the number of seats either entirely or just increasing the proportion of seats that are elected on this national list or on a similar national list system. Um, and, and changing that so that there is incentive for political parties to actually form around coherent platforms and try and galvanize support on a nationwide basis. Um, and and as, as Les said, you know, actually giving the parliament real decision-making authority will prompt people to want to compete for power and win elections. Without that, there's no incentive to join a political party. You can't mandate them out of thin air just uh, for the sake of existence. It becomes a social club. That's not meaningful. So you have to have a reason to want to join a political party and compete for power. And until that's there, there's not going to be a vibrant political party life. And one wonders if the king couldn't move in the direction of Morocco, you know, where um, through a constitutional declaration, you know, you now have uh, the appointment of the prime minister by the majority party. Um, and the prime minister uh, can also dissolve parliament and, and, and form the cabinet. Uh, that prime minister is an Islamist. Morocco, you know, is, is moving along. It's taken more serious reforms. My question to, to feed off of yours is, you know, why can't Abdullah do more of the same? Um, but I think you, you, you reference the regional challenges and, and the fears that clearly the uh, government is grappling with. Um, on that note, I think we'll, we're out of time. Uh, we'll, we'll meet again after the next <laughs> set of elections in Jordan. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. So that'll be in a year. Yeah. Yeah, you've got your you've got Lebanon coming up now.